Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us at New Jersey Revolution Radio. This week, confronting the Empire's war agenda with Ajamu Baraka, a special presentation brought to you by the U.S. Peace Council, www.peacecouncil.org. If you'd like to help support more programming like this or see more independent media, visit us at www.njrevolutionradio.com. So... Very honored, very pleased to have Ajamu Baraka here today, and also Bam and Izad. We're going to have um, Ajamu is going to begin. Bam is going to speak after. Ajamu is an executive committee member of the U.S. Peace Council, and he's also the national coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace. And you all probably know him too, since there's a lot of Greens here in the in the audience as a 2016 vice presidential candidate, Dr. Joe Stein. So we're very honored to have Ajamu Baraka address us on NATO, and well, actually his the official title of his presentation is Confronting the Empire's War Agenda, The Struggle for Peace and Social Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And um, thank all of you for coming out this evening. Uh, for we hope to have a very uh, important, very um, <laughs> rich conversation. <laughs> we, um, we are involved in a, um, a mini tour. The objective of this tour is to uh, build support for the actions that are coming up in in March, uh, but the objective also is to not just mobilize opposition in these very important uh, actions, but to uh, suggest to the people of this country that we have to have to do more than just mobilization, <laughs> that building effective and powerful organizations is a, a critical uh, uh, in, in a critical objective that we have to realize because those of us who are here in the center of, of empire, we are the only force that can put a break on the kind of, of madness that we have witnessed here in this country for the last couple of decades. <laughs> so we, we start off with our, our call, our call to, to the people. We say, all power to the people. Power to the people. All power to the people. Power to, All the, power people. to the people. That has to be the objective. We say to our, our friends um, across the country that at this critical moment, we pose a serious question. As we see that the U.S. is um, involved in destabilization, uh, with the possibility of war in Venezuela. Uh, we see this coming on the heels of what has been a veritable rampage on the part of this state across the so-called Middle East, mm -hmm. displacing millions of people, over a million people who have now lost their lives. And so we say to the people of this country, how much war? How much more death and destruction will you endure before you break with the capitalist duopoly of your government and say, no more war, no more subversion, no more killings in my name by a state that by every definition has become a rogue state and a threat to global humanity. That's the task we have before us, my friends. The people of this country are decent people. <clears throat> They've just been manipulated down to their very bones. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is that ba basic decency that's been weaponized by the state using this weapon of humanitarian intervention mm -hmm. and the responsibility to protect. But underneath this concept is a very contradictory set of values. In this 
ideal that the U.S. has the right to go and save other peoples using any means necessary, we see that what we see is that this is a cover for the continuation of a historic project. Mm -hmm. The project, the continued project of white supremacist domination. And the very fact that a, a, a argument can be made that the US has a right and a responsibility to go into a sovereign nation unilaterally to determine, to determine the leadership of that state without significant opposition from the US public, it really uh, reflects the level of, of not only depravity, but also the extent in which these notions of the US having that kind of right and responsibility has been inculcated in the culture and in the consciousness of people here in this country. The very fact that you have this kind of move, which is objectively a, a gangster move, you, we might recall, and if you don't recall, you may have, have, have studied in history. How many people know about or remember or studied the um, uh, Bay of Pigs, the invasion of Cuba by the US? Now, we remember that this was a covert operation, correct? No one knew about it. They trained, they put together that force, they trained them, uh, they placed them on the beach. And in fact, uh, when they uh, met the resistance of the Cuban people, and they were calling for uh, air support uh, from the US government, uh, John Kennedy decided that that was too risky to uh, provide direct air support because that would expose the fact that the US was the primary force that created that invasion and was supporting it. They wanted to perpetuate the fiction that this was some kind of independent action on the part of 1,500 Cubans. Fast forward to today. They don't have to operate in the shadows. They have announced, basically, without any legal justification, both in terms of international law and even US constitutional law, they have said, basically, we have decided that the uh, government of Venezuela is illegal, that uh, it, they, they lack democracy, and therefore, we're going to uh, subvert the government. And if they don't allow this uh, humanitarian aid to come in, we're going to basically push ourselves into this sovereign nation using any means necessary to make uh, and effect regime change. A straight up gangster move that's supported by apparently most of the people in this country. So it shows you how far we have, have come, if you will, or degenerated in terms of uh, international and national morality. That basically now they can uh, do whatever they want to do to advance their interests with the support of most of the people in this country. So what we see, my friends, is a uh, behavior that is a uh, behavior that is, is, is defined as a rogue state, rogue behavior, rogue, is, rogue statism, if you will. The definition of a, of a rogue state a nation or state regarded as breaking international law and posing a threat to the security of other nations. That's a rogue state. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it seems like that is a classic definition of what we see unfolding here in this country with the US state. So we say to progressives, we say to people of conscious, there is no objective right bestowed upon the United States of America by either God or a human that grants the US the right and responsibility to intrude and to impose his will on other people. We must 
must categorically reject, categorically reject this arrogant white supremacist assumption that the U.S. is self a capitalist dictatorship can presume it has the right to make these kinds of changes. A uh, U.S. that uh, has a so-called democratic process in which a candidate can uh, outpace another candidate by three million votes and still lose. A democracy in which uh, a major political party can engage in systematic vote suppression. A democracy in which a so-called constitutional right or constitutional protections against an oppressed national uh, minority through a uh, name the Voting Rights Act can be eliminated with no opposition. A democracy in which they engage in systematic voter suppression where people are sent to prison and when they come out they, are have, they no longer have the right to participate in the so-called democracy. If the U.S. was concerned about democracy, the first place they should be looking at is here in this country. So my friends, we have a responsibility. We have to build a movement. Uh, we have to shift power from these maniacs uh, to the masses of the people. But that is why we started to engage in the process of building this Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance of Peace is an organization that's committed to peace, of course. What rational person would be opposed to peace? But we understand that there can be no peace without justice. Therefore, this alliance is a fighting formation. We understand that we're not going to have peace as long as power resides in the hands of these maniacs. And we're not just talking about the Trump administration. That's an easy target. We talk about the fact that Trump is no more than a symptom of, the, of, a, of a disease. That this uh, oppressive system is based on the bipartisan collaboration of both of these capitalist uh, racist parties. That both of these parties uh, uh, support the imperialist agenda. That's why there's no opposition to this gangster move on Venezuela. The Democrats uh, criticize Donald Trump. They call him everything you can imagine. But when it comes to a move against Venezuela or uh, a concern about whether or not Trump might uh, strike some kind of peace deal with uh, North Korea, then basically, you know, either they will support Trump in Venezuela or they'll try to undermine him when it comes to a situation like North Korea. So he's a liar and a charlatan, but when it comes to him declaring that he has a, a, a concern about the humanity of people in Venezuela, then we're supposed to believe that. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. But yet you see that all of the corporate media that go along with that, they're basically uh, are pushing the notion that um, uh, Trump is correct on Venezuela, um, and it's only a few people in the in the uh, Congress, a few uh, uh, Democrats, uh, that have spoken out on this situation in a very strong and clear way. But they are in the vast minority. So we've got to understand if we are concerned with peace, if we are opposed to this kind of, of gangsterism. Um, that is, is motivated by imperialist objectives, the only force that can put a break on this kind of activity is, in fact, the people. So we started building this Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance for Peace is an organization that is against war, repression, and imperialism. We are opposed to war and imperialism externally, but also opposed to domestic repression here internally. We understand that there's a link between the gangsterism and war mongering externally 
and the war being waged against African people and, and, and oppressed people here in this country. We say that basically um, U.S. exceptionalism and Trump's Make America Great are two sides of the same white supremacist imperialist coin. That this is part of the same system, a system that's organized to uh, degrade and dehumanize people in the U.S. and to degrade, dehumanize, and exploit people globally. We understand that this system and its rulers are prepared to fight to the last drop of your blood mm -hmm. and mine mm -hmm. in order to maintain their dominance, but we've got to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not just concerned with U.S. imperialism. We're concerned with the entire uh, structure of dominance. We are opposed to the bipartisan uh, pivot to Asia. We're concerned with an opposed uh, rotating of NATO troops on the borders of Russia. The destabilization uh, and militarization of Africa under the U.S. Africa Command. We are opposed to the role of the Israeli state in providing training to police forces across this country. We are opposed to the Department of Defense's 1033 program. How many people know about that program? The program that is primarily responsible for militarizing police forces oh, yeah. across this country. Right, no, I know, I didn't know the number. They have uh, transferred something like $4.1 billion in terms of uh, military equipment from the federal government to police forces across this country. Yeah. Equipment that's then used in the war against black folks and the working class in general. Okay? So we are opposed to the 1033 program. So we make those connections, my friends. You make those links. Uh, we stand with the uh, globalized, uh, colonized, of uh, people uh, in the global south who are fighting for authentic decolonization and national self-determination. And in that stand, we have to identify who our friends and who our enemies are. We've got to be clear about that. We all have to be clear about that. When we see the decision made by the European Parliament a few weeks ago uh, that uh, declared that they were going to support the Juan Guaido mm -hmm. as the so-called legitimate uh, president of Venezuela. That was not a surprise for us because we had already recognized that basically there is a, a structural, ideological, philosophical, and emotional and psychological connection between the U.S. settler state and the European Union. So we say basically that we are opposed to what we call the US, EU, NATO axis of domination. <laughs> that is, my friends, the common enemy. That is the common enemy. And we've got to name the common enemy. So Venezuela is basically the latest example, the latest expression of uh, this bipartisan unity to advance the interests of this axis of domination. This axis of domination is part of, it is the, the operationalization of the pan-European white supremacist colonial capitalist patriarchy that emerged uh, beginning in 1492. So we're clear about these connections and we understand that we can't have an effective anti-imperialist uh, movement, an anti-imperialist fight. We can't uh, talk about uh, class uh, consciousness and class unity without addressing these kinds of contradictions. There can be no class unity unless people are prepared to deal with the consequences and reality of white supremacy. 
If we don't deal with that effectively, then of course the enemy will deal with that. And we see the results of that across Europe mm -hmm. and in this country. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of the neo-fascist movement that's developing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't address that, then basically you are in essence feeding into it. Mm -hmm. So Venezuela is the latest expression of this madness. Uh, we mentioned the fact that we've seen what the U.S. has been involved in for the last two decades. We have to remind people um, in this country, and we remind people specifically among African people in this country, about what happens when you don't resist U.S. intervention in these various countries. Uh, we have to remind people that in Venezuela, uh, objectively, uh, about 52% of that population, if you use the racial categories that we have in this country, about 52% of that population would be classified as black. So we're talking about an attack on, in essence, a black nation. Mm -hmm. So we remind people of what happened uh, the last time the U.S. intervened militarily in a largely people of color nation in Latin America. Does anybody remember what that what that nation was the last time we had a direct military intervention here Panama. in Latin America? Panama. Panama. 1989. Mm -hmm. They went into effect of uh, an arrest. The U.S. is going to go into another country and arrest the leader of that country in 1989. Okay? They made El Chirio, a, a community 90% uh, black, in essence a free fire zone because there was some barracks of the, of the, of the of Panamanian, Panamanian military in that community. And the result of that intervention resulted in three to 5,000 people dying. The majority of those people being black. We know that if the military goes into, into Venezuela, if they are successful in igniting um, a war in Venezuela, uh, because the, the bulk of the support for the Bolivarian process are with black people and brown people, that it's going to be black people who will disproportionately die as a consequence of any war in Venezuela. But that's not our main concern. We're concerned about humanity in general. But we have to let people understand the racial component of this also. This is, these are just objective realities we have to deal with. So we have to fight back, my friends. We have to build this movement. Uh, we've got to uh, find the basis of unity across the various struggles. Uh, there are things that are being organized right now uh, to assist us in this fight back. Um, the immediate uh, mobilization is taking place March 16th in Washington. Uh, many of you may have heard about that. This is a, a, a national mobilization to oppose the intervention. We have a uh, bus. And there's a bus being organized here uh, in this city. And that's fantastic. Uh, two weeks after that mobilization, we are organizing a, um, a, 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 an event in Washington again on March 30th. And we'll have a the, bus for that at least one. There you go. <laughs> that basically what we have to do, we are targeting NATO. You know, we said NATO's part of this axis of domination, okay? So March 30th, we're going back to DC as part of our opposition to NATO, okay? Um, this work that we're doing on NATO to oppose NATO as a white supremacist structure, uh, again, is part of that axis of domination. Um, it is part of a, a effort that we have organized uh, uh, with other uh, groups here in this country uh, to create a coalition that is targeting uh, NATO, an international campaign uh, to oppose NATO and all of NATO's bases. That campaign um, emerged out of a coalition that was built here in this country. And Brown's gonna talk about that some more. Uh, a conference we had last January, uh, in which we came out of that conference with a new coalition, the coalition to close all U.S. foreign bases. Hmm. NATO US. US. And then the, the international campaign came, uh, came what was organized in November of last year. And out of that, conference, 
we came up with the international campaign to close all U.S. Uh, foreign bases and NATO bases. So these are the efforts we have to engage in and the activities between March uh, 30th and April 4th are activities to help to educate people in this country on the role of NATO uh, and to oppose NATO and to build support for all of our work around closing NATO, shutting down the AFRICOM or the U.S. Africa Command, make, making the link between uh, imperialism and domestic repression. Uh, these are the kinds of things we have to do in order to, to build an effective fight back uh, to oppose this madness. The last thing, and I'm gonna sit down after this. Whatever one's uh, opinions may be about uh, related to the electoral process, uh, we think in the Black Alliance of Peace that if we're going to defeat those triplets of racism and, and materialism and militarism, um, we've got to make this issue of war and militarism uh, an issue in the national discourse around the electoral process in 2020. So we say, we say that we, we have some proposals that if a candidate or if a representative wants to continue in office, mm -hmm. then we, we, we suggest some, some positions that they must take in order to win the support of the population, in order to win our votes. We say that all candidates must support efforts to cut uh, the military budget by 50% as a start. Use those resources to fully fund social programs that address issues of education and housing, to develop uh, green jobs and health care uh, to people in this country. We say that these candidates must commit to passing resolutions at every level of government to bring the U.S. in alignment with international law and the United Nations. We say they must promote the closing of the over 800 to 1,000 bases, U.S. bases. They must call for and work to close the U.S. Africa Command, AFRICOM, and withdraw all U.S. military personnel from Africa. They must commit to, in, to ending the uh, militarization of police forces through the Department of Defense 1033 program. <laughs> and demand that the uh, Department of Justice document and investigate all instances of use of lethal, le le lethal force against non-white populations as demanded by various human rights treaty monitoring bodies. And they must advocate that the U.S. adhere to the United Nations Resolution of July 2017 to eliminate all nuclear weapons globally. So my friends, this is what we have to do. We have to build a powerful movement, but understanding the limitations and the challenges we have uh, before us to do that. But we are up to the task. You know, we cannot uh, determine the kinds of conditions that we are born into, <clears throat> that we face uh, as human beings. But we can determine how we respond to those conditions. And for many of us, and for most of you in this room, we have decided that we're going to struggle. We're going to fight. We're going to you know, oppose injustice. So my friends, let's uh, take up that responsibility. Let's go to the to the public. Let's educate the people on these kinds of situations with Venezuela, with NATO. Uh, let's help the people understand that they, in fact, have the power to make change. That the enemy will try to make us think 
that we don't have the power, that uh, there is no alternative. But we have a responsibility to envision something beyond this, to be committed to, to building a world that transcends this kind of, this kind of madness. So my friends, we are clear about what we have to do. Let's go out, let's do it, let's build this movement, and let's win back this world for ourselves. Right. Thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in this week. We'll be returning next week with Diane Moxley and her usual live stream show. But this week we want to thank the U.S. Peace Council, Madeline Hoffman, Bahamazad, and of course, Ajamu Baraka for doing this with New Jersey Revolution Radio. If you'd like to support more work and see more of this type of media out there, please visit www.njrevolutionradio.com and make a contribution if you can. Thanks. <laughs>